live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's The Cube, covering Red Hat Summit 2019, brought to you by Red Hat. And welcome back here on The Cube as we continue our coverage here at Red Hat Summit. Day one of three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage coming to you exclusively here on The Cube. I'm John Walls with Stu Miniman. Thank you for joining us and we're now joined by a couple of gentlemen, I guess the dynamic duo of uh, the container world at, uh, at uh, Red Hat. Scott McCarty is the principal product manager of containers at OpenShift and Pharrell. Scott, good to see you, sir. Yeah, good to see you. And Ben Briard, who's the principal product manager of containers in CoreOS, of course, also at Red Hat. Uh, ben, thank, thank you. you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having us. First off, just your thought about the show. Uh, uh, obviously, there's a lot of educational programming going on up and down, big crowds, a lot of buzz, good activity day one, at least from our perspective. How are you guys seeing this so far? Oh, loving it. I mean, it's been great so far. I, we just had a, I just had a session, just got out of it, it was completely full. I mean, there was people trying to get in that were lined up against the wall, so it's been very exciting so far. Yeah, Ben? It's always one of my favorite times of the year, right? It's so much energy. Everybody comes with the exchange of ideas and just feedback and everything. It's, it's one of my favorites. Oh, good, right? Yeah. All right, so RHEL 8 uh, made available publicly today for the first time. We've talked about that a lot uh, so far on the program. I'd like to hear from your side of the fence then. What does that mean to you in terms of the, the container world and, and uh, the impact that you, you know, from here going forward, you've got a whole new world of concern, I would think, Scott. Yeah, I mean, with the RHEL 8, it's, been, it, it's exciting because we're releasing, uh, you know, a lot of new tools around containers, um, a, a ton of new operational, you know, management capabilities. I mean, it's just, it's an exciting release. Mm -hmm. ben, it's, a, it's a big step forward, right? Every single release is a big deal. And when we look at the container space, it's evolved a lot in the past four or five years, right, when we came out with RHEL 7. So the technology's matured. RHEL 8, it's a, it's a smooth, easy experience to get to the release, and it, it, a lot's gone into it. In this yeah, space. a lot. Yeah, so, Scott, it, it's funny. I think back, turn back five years ago, we had a lot of jokes about um, Dockers, you mean the pants? Yeah. Um, because uh, containerization <laughs> and uh, you know, Linux containers and everything that was something most people hadn't heard about. Here 2019, you said there's you know, crowds trying to get in the door, and it's yeah. not what, but they're really digging in and understanding the tools. Give us a little bit of you know, what, what's, what's the excitement these days, where are the customers, and you know, what, what are you digging into with them? Yeah, I, well, well, a funny example, similar, I, I, asked, I, I asked this last session, you know, raise your hand if you've used containers, if you just even fired up a container before, and everyone raised their hand. And now five years ago, that was like one person. <laughs> and then even last year. You worked year, for Google. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and even last year, it was still maybe 40% of the people, and right. now it's 100% when they come to a session. So I mean, it's, it is it is definitely changed a tremendous amount. And now it's about, so I joked, you know, five years ago it was about using a chef knife. You know, just like you cut everything with it, right? You cut vegetables, meat, whatever. And there was like one thing, and you were just figuring out Docker, and, and Kubernetes wasn't even on the radar yet. Um, and now it's about refining all the tools and getting to a place where like, it's really getting exciting because now we have special pairing knives and, and chef knife and a you know, hibachi knife and all these different, you know, more specialized tools, so it's getting exciting. I think it's easier to adopt now too, right? Because a few years ago, everyone was hedging their bets on you know, what orchestration am I going to use? What piece am I going to build my stack with? Yeah. And now it's much, much clearer, it's well-defined. You know, Kubernetes is dominant factor, right? I mean, OpenShift is huge, huge, huge growth for us in that space. So, I mean, it's 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 a lot easier for customers to get in that game now than it was, you know, yeah, just a couple years ago. Yeah, just a couple years ago. All right, so let's let's dig in on security a little bit yeah. because that was one of the big question marks in the early days, and you know, it's something we talk about at all the shows. It's it's definitely a focus of of the Rel8 launch. So, where are we with the container world today, and, and anything new or nuanced that uh, the audience should understand? I think on the security side, you've got I don't know three or four big points there. One is the container tools that we're shipping today. Uh, they basically inherit the full Linux security model, right? So no longer do you have a privileged socket that is like kind of that weak vector, if you will. That's gone in Rel 8. So that's a big that's a big win right there. Um, beyond that, uh, we've got a new uh, crypto policy. So you can set a central policy for the OS, and that works in the container as well. So if you want to enforce a particular uh, kind of floor, if you will, of crypto, you can do that with Rel 8 for the host and images as well. 
Uh, that's, a, that's a big part of it. And then we also have new tools that you can build smaller containers because part of the security is what is in my container. So if you're putting less, less packages and content in that image, uh, that's a much smaller vector as well. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, from, a, from a security perspective too, you know, you know, the fact that now we have um, kind of a, we, we've got a set of tools now that we can do experiments with, things like Rootless, for example, yeah. you know, or Tech Preview release of, of Rootless containers. So historically, we've always ran them um, you know, as root. That was just how it worked. I mean, we kind of figured it out one way and did it and, it, and it was cool. And then at a certain point, we went, all right, we need these other use cases where we want developers to be able to do it, for example. Um, I just talked to a customer that has four, or 200, I'm sorry, developers that are all running uh, instances on their laptops, VMs with Podman and Buildo running, and, and you know, using these tools to actually build containers. And, and they want to do rootless bad. They want to do it in, all their, in, in essentially all their environments. So that people are really hungry for a, a lot of these security features that we're working on now in Rel8. Yeah. And in some of that we're releasing even as of 8.0. How, how do the capabilities change in terms of Rel8 now and, and what you have to provide to support them? So what's transformed and then what will be the need in order to, to build on that, to work on that, and to make it more secure, stable, so on and so forth? Uh, well, I think, it, I think you kind of have to dig into like the selection of what tools we decided. So in, in Rel8 you'll see that it's, it's Podman, Builder, and Scopia are the three main lower level tools that we have. And those tools are, are built sort of in a Unix mindset where it's, it's like you can pipe things together and do things and use them collaboratively together to go remotely inspect the images, pull them, build them from scratch, um, you know, run them locally, not as root, so run them as a non-root container, things like that. Um, we are not adding, you know, we're not releasing Docker and Rel8, and so, so the transition there is probably the biggest transition for users is kind of realizing, okay, we're going to, we've kind of broken this apart into three littler tools that we can then use, um, Podman being the main one that you'd go to, mm -hmm. and, then, and then it's got a command line that's very similar, and so it's very easy to kind of tr transition over, but then you start to, again, kind of to my, to my chef knife reference, you realize once you transition from, say, Docker to Podman, you kind of, that's your chef knife. You kind of know what, how to start doing things that way, but then you start to get more refined and start to dig deeper into, you know, like, pot, you know, into build and Scopio, essentially. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> ben, ben, you're good there? Yeah, I don't, I don't have All much right. to say. All right, whatever he says. <laughs> um, Scott, uh, the universal base image, something we've talked a little bit about. Uh, to tell us how that this is going to impact, you know, talked about everybody building things on their laptop. Seems like that's an extension uh, of where this fits. Uh, help, help us understand. Yeah, I, c I can't hide my enthusiasm on how excited I am by UBI, and okay. I will admit, I've already had a couple people come up to me and say, this is the most exciting thing for me at Summit, period. And I think that's interesting because it's not actually something new in that, you would say, from a technology perspective, how exciting is it? I don't know, but like, it allows a, a set of collaboration that we've never been able to like really, really do with a rel base image historically. And I think the rel base image is the highest quality base image that's ever been out there. But the problem is, is even if you had something really simple, like say you had one university and they created some kind of science experiment in a container, and then they wanted to push that out to a public registry, then pull it down at a different university and share it, they couldn't do that under the terms of the rel base image. And so that, was, that, was, that created a little bit of friction. With UBI, now that's completely gone. You can now run it anywhere you want, distribute it anywhere you want, and just the distribution alone is exciting, and the fact that when you run it on rel, you build on rel, run on rel, it's completely supported, it is rel, but you can now push it out to a public registry and let it sit out there and other people can use it and experiment, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So, so is, is the, the you know, coming together of containerization in that distribution, is that what kind of is really new uh, with this as opposed to the ways that I used to be able to share Linux images in the past? Well, all, I, think, I think the challenge was you'd have some people that would want to use something, they'd want to be able to distribute it anywhere. They right. want to have that freedom, but they still wanted the quality of the rel base image, and that, was, that created friction, right? So then they'd have to make an unnatural choice between like, well, I use Fedora, or I use you know, rel, or maybe I use CentOS, and you're like, eh, none of those have all the things that I want, right? It was like a card game, trying to get all the components that you want. You want the supportability of rel, you want the security, the performance, et cetera, et cetera, but you couldn't, you couldn't distribute it anywhere. And so that created friction where you make unnatural choices on a base image, and now UBI just, the name implies it universally. You can just use it for anything you want. Same, same for communities too, right? Because yep. they don't want to make uh, one that could freely distribute and then another like supported variant. Yep. It's more to maintain, it's more cycles and everything. So simplifying that is a, is a big deal. Yeah, and, and a migration between base images is a Linux migration. So it's frustrating to do. You don't want to do it. You want to build on one thing and then build to distribute that thing anywhere. Well, yeah, Ben, it's interesting. You know, I go back a few years. There, there was this big movement to do like just enough OS. How do mm. I slim down the OS? Yeah. 
core OS was, I don't need everything that, you know, RHEL necessarily does. So have we gotten over that? Have we now gotten with, you know, the things like UBI down to uh, like a nice unit that's easily shareable and distributed? It's a, it's a good question. It's a topic that will never go away, I don't think. We're, yeah. we're still, it's just changing its form, right? It still exists on the host, it still exists in images, it still yeah. exists with now unikernels and, and everything. Right. Um, I think where we are today, though, is a really good spot, right? We've got uh, several footprints of UBI. Yep. There's several footprints of RHEL, including RHEL Core OS, which is like an embedded version of RHEL into OpenShift, right, for a small form factor container host. So, I. Where we are today is very strong, yeah. but it's going to continue to evolve and get better, so. Yeah, and we, I mean, we look at the future and we're, we're looking at ways to, to make it even smaller. You know, you're always looking at it, but yeah, Ben mentioned there's three footprints of UBI. Today there's a minimal image, there's a standard image, and then there's even a little bit bigger image that allows you to run multiple services. But um, you know, that's the selection today, but in the future, we're looking at making the minimal one more minimal. We're even looking at you know, making the, the, the standard one more minimal. Yeah. We're, we're not done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're not done. You're yeah, never done. Yeah, I, I guess uh, the last thing I have on this, uh, you know, multi-cloud is such, you know, it's where customers are today. You know, you're, you're going to have you know, the CEO of Microsoft up on stage today. Uh, two years ago when I was here, it was the partnership between Red Hat and AWS was all the discussion. Yeah. Uh, I spoke to the Red Hat team at the Google Cloud Show uh, recently. So how does the tooling that you have fit into all the cloud uh, discussions that I have? When, when I talk to users, you know, one of the biggest lock-ins they have is the skill set and the understanding of different tools and knowledge. And so, you know, where we standardize and where do we still have work to do in this space? That's a big question. So, yeah. I guess on, we address it on multiple levels, right? So, at the core, the center is RHEL, right? So, RHEL 8, right, announced today on all those cloud platforms that you just named, right? So same OS, same ABI level, guarantee that 10 year same life hardware stability, selection, yeah. everything, it's, it's everywhere. Sure. It's pervasive today. Uh, level up, right? You got the container images and stuff, same story there. Go a level up, you've got OpenShift that is pervasive everywhere and now we're doing really cool things in Kubernetes like the machine API and all these other things to yeah. actually control those individual cloud infrastructures which abstracts all of the customizations per per footprint, which is powerful, so. Yeah. I, I think for me, one of the most exciting things is, is, the, is the OpenShift 4 paradigm shift. That shift from managing individual nodes to, shift to managing the cluster as a computer, which we've said for what, 20 years with Sun, I think, you know, uh, the cluster is the computer, you know, like, but we're really there today. Like, we have a single API, Ben mentioned the machine, the machine API, the machine config operator. There's, there's essentially automation built into the OpenShift platform now that allows you to deploy it the same on any cloud. So AWS, Azure, you know, uh, OpenStack, even on VMware, even on, you know, even in LibVirt on a local laptop, there's a way to deploy it in the, in the identical, you know, in an identical configuration. And to me that's exciting because now I have one set of things I can learn. And then again, in the standard Red Hat way, if you feel locked in, you can go use the OKD, you can use the upstream. So you're mm -hmm. never locked into our product, which that's something I get a lot with the cloud drivers, right? Like if you're locked in there, you're, you're locked in there. There's no, there's no you know, open source version of that to, to get out of that. So you, you've talked about growth opportunities. You said, you know, we're not done yet, making the joke about your own work. You've talked about a 20 year evolution. You know, you just refer to that. In, in, in if you could look, you know, whether it's three, four, five, whatever years down the road. Where's the big leap? Where does it have to come? Or where do you think it's going to come in terms of the capabilities that you want to work on and what you want to be able to deliver uh, from where you are right now? Let me get my crystal ball. Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> I think you've got one. Yeah. Then I have a lot of confidence in you and Scott. But if you had to say, okay, this is, this is at least where we're going to be, we're going to have to spend a lot of our time because this, this is the area that we think, I think, needs the most attention. Yeah. I, a couple things, right? Uh, people only scale so much. So automation is an area that's bulletproof going forward. And, and it's going to evolve and take many forms. Right now, our big push has been in the operator space and obviously technologies like Ansible. That's going to continue to evolve and make, make people uh, scale better. That's probably yeah. one of the biggest ones. I don't know. There's probably I, I think more. that's one of the biggest ones. I think, I think for me, probably, where my mind wanders is, is around partners and building that ecosystem in the OpenShift space, similar to what you see in the RHEL ecosystem today. I think three, four years from now, you're going to see it really explode. I already see that. I already see it exploding, but by then you'll see it maturing, mm -hmm. and, and you'll really see. I think if you look at the operator paradigm, I'm very excited by that because it's kind of like the 
MSI installer that Microsoft invented, you know, that kind of made that, that ubiquitous, that install experience. Except that operators make it ubiquitous to install and manage day two. So I think like kind of to his point of like making that the install really simple and then the operation of it over time, I think you're going to see a lot of, I think, I think you could fill a room and ask them like what's, I, in fact I did, I asked them what an operator was, you know, and they, did, they weren't super aware of it yet. Mm -hmm. But I think in the next five years that will become the ubiquitous way of just installing software. All right, well we're going to check back with the N5. We'll see how it turns out. And uh, Ben, by then, bring that crystal ball back with you, though, <laughs> no if you would, okay? <laughs> I'll do it. Good deal. Thanks, gentlemen. Thanks for the time. <laughs> yeah, Appreciate thank you. having both of you uh, on theCUBE as we continue our coverage here at Red Hat Summit. We're in Boston. Back with more right after this.